Hello, and good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name's Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. And we're glad you're with us for tonight's program with Rebecca Mensch, uh, Spot the Mollusk. And hello also from a, a hot uh, but lovely Sanibel, looking out of my office window right now, and hope, hope things are well and the weather is good where, wherever you may be. We're, this is the first of our uh, summer and fall lecture series, which is all going to be online and all free of charge. Uh, we thank Mark and Kathy Helge very much for a gift, which has made this lecture series possible. And we're glad to present it via Zoom. We know a lot of the museum's members and supporters and people who like to participate in our programs um, travel or are elsewhere in the, uh, in, uh, in the summer and fall months. So we like to be able to, to make this available to, to as many people as possible. And Zoom and video conferencing helps, helps, helps make that possible. Uh, Becca's to talk tonight is the first, and we have five. They'll be uh, monthly through October. And just to quickly preview some of the other talks, uh, next month, July 13th, uh, anyone in particular with an interest in cephalopods and octopuses, highly, highly recommend um, tune in for this one. It's Brett Grassi, who is the manager of cephalopod operations at Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Um, this means basically he's a, a, a great expert on octopuses, squids, cuttlefish, and all kinds of, of cool cephalopods. Prior to Woods Hole, he uh, helped design uh, the cephalopod exhibits out at uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, and he's a great speaker. So that's on July 13th. In August, our own Jose Leal will be joined by Dr. Rudiger Bieler, who is the curator of invertebrates at the Field Museum in Chicago. And the two of them are, are among a, a group that's working on a very important project to document mollusk species distribution throughout the Eastern Seaboard. Their talk will be in August. In September, Dr. Megan Davis um, from the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute and the Queen Conch Laboratory will give a talk. She has been working for 40 years on helping to save the Queen Conch species, including among other things, working with Caribbean nations to um, build sustainable um, aquaculture facilities for Queen Conch. So she'll be talking about her work in that area, which is really interesting. And then in October, Dr. Jan Vendetti, who is the curator of mal malacology at the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History, will be talking about a project that she started six or seven years ago. It's a citizen science project where uh, she has organized uh, lots of people in the LA area to document um, mollusk, mostly land snail, but mollusk um, distribution and populations in, in Los Angeles. And it's really interesting to um, learn about what that looks like in a, in a, in a well, one of the biggest urban environments in the world. So um, that'll be coming in October. Those are all, uh, you can register for all of those on the museum's website, free of charge. And, um, and we hope you join us for, for as many as you'd like. Uh, all of, of these talks, um, including you know, all the all the Zoom programs that we did in uh, 2021, are or will be available on the museum's website and on our YouTube channel, free of charge. You know, at any time to view. Uh, usually, it takes a, a few days for us to get a program up after it's aired live. But uh, you could look for this one, for example, next week on our website or on YouTube, and it should be there. Um, as well as I think about, about a dozen uh, lectures from, from last year. Let's see, a couple, a couple of house, housekeeping notes. Um, please, please mute your, um, your, uh, your machines, your mics there if you haven't already. And um, with questions, please use the chat function, which is along the, the bottom um, of your screen. If you move your, your cursor along, you'll see chat. You can type in, type in your question. We'll do, we'll do Q&A at the end of Becca's talk and, um, and type in your questions and we'll, we'll answer them um, as they come in. You can type the question in, in any time. You don't need to wait until the end, but um, that's, that's when we'll be able to get to them. And 
I guess without further ado then, um, would like to, to introduce uh, my, my colleague and the museum's great senior marine biologist, um, Rebecca Mensch, who has, has been with the museum for uh, I think eight or nine years now, um, has, has worked in all areas of the museum, in collections, um, in the aquariums with, with, the, with living animals. Um, she's a great educator. Uh, worked with our volunteers. She was an important part of the of conceiving the um, uh, the aquariums, the living gallery um, that we that we enjoy today. And um, she's great to work with, and a and a great um, advocate for. And as you'll see, he's got has got a, a great passion and interest for um, for this remarkable group of animals, mollusks. So, um, we'll uh, Becca, welcome to the, to the screen. And, Thank you. Uh, Hello. Program. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, and thanks everybody for joining me for this first uh, first of our summer lecture series. I know um, Sam already told you a little bit about them. Um, today I'm going to start off our summer lecture series, kind of ease into this new um, to our new phase here with some nice, pretty pictures, cool videos. I don't have any data or graphs or anything for you, so this is uh, hopefully something you can just kind of enjoy while we get into kind of more further and further into to deeper sciences later on in the year, later on in the summer. Um, so today we're gonna talk about some of the really cool stuff that mollusks do in order to avoid detection. So they have a lot of things that they do to protect themselves. Um, they have physical defenses, primarily their shell. Um, they have different behaviors. They have hiding, they have swimming, they have a lot of other things that they can, that they can physically do. Some of them have chemical defenses. So a lot of people know about squid and octopus creating ink. Um, some of them actually use nematocysts, which are stinging cells that you find in corals and jellies. Um, and then other ones, just their overall appearance can, uh, can help them avoid detection. And today I'm gonna to talk about the appearances of a lot of these things. So the physical shell is a, the shell is generally a physical defense, but the appearance of it can sometimes also help avoid detection. Um, behaviors, a lot of those behaviors, uh, instead of just swimming away and getting away, can be behaviors about not being seen. Um, so today we're, uh, we're going to talk about appearances. Um, so, so to start off spot the mollusk, here I have a mollusk spotting you. So this is a uh, local Florida fighting conch. You can see the two blue eyes sticking out, staring straight at you, um, spotting you, staring back at it. So let's start off with the shell appearance. These are Atlantic calico scallops. Um, they're both kind of huffing and puffing. You can see their really blue sapphire eyes. They look almost like they're glowing in the dark. And that's the lens reflecting off light. Um, just like how we get kind of red eye in pictures, it's because of that, that lens re uh, reflecting light. And so when we look at these Atlantic calico scallops, we can see the top valve or part of the shell is different than the bottom part. So the top valve is, which a valve is just a shell part, um, has the, all the color and pattern. This is a really popular shell for shellers here on Sanibel because they are each unique. Every single one of these looks a little bit different. And the contrast between the white and the red or pinks is, um, is very pretty and stunning and st sticks out very easily. Um, and they're also pretty big and neat shape. So a lot of people like to collect these what a lot of people don't realize because they're only ever finding one half of the shell is that the top side and the bottom part are different. They're mirror images as far as shape, but the colors and patterns on them are totally different. So this one on the left, you can see the top is where all the red modeling color is and the bottom is pure white. And then on the right, you can see the top valve has a nice orange stripe in the center and then some reds and pinks. And then the bottom valve though is just plain white. And this is actually counter shading. So counter shading is being dark on the top, light on the bottom, um, as something we see like in great white sharks. So it's the idea of when something's looking down at the top of it, it looks dark and it blends in, or if something's looking up at the bottom of it, it blends in with the sunlight. So with these scallops, you can see how they like to live down on the bottom. When these are out in their natural habitat in seagrass beds and stuff, red sunlight, red light, light waves are as the first light wave to get filtered out of sunlight. So even in crystal clear water at about 10 feet of water, 
red just kind of starts to look brownish. So then when you add like tannins and stuff into these back bay waters at just a couple feet of feet of water, this red shell is going to start to look a little brown. And the way the pattern is kind of matches the way that sunlight dances down on the bottom. So if you've ever looked at a pool while well, sunlight's kind of playing around and dancing around, it, um, it kind of resembles what this pattern looks like. So if there's a, a predator swimming over this animal and looking down at this top shell, it's gonna be hard for this animal even to pick out the shell. It's gonna be hard for it to tell, like where does it start? Where is then? Where's the edge of this? And then these scallops can also get up and swim. So it's possible that a predator would be underneath it looking up at that bottom side. So that bottom white, white part, white half of the shell, white valve, blends in with any sunlight that would be coming down from, uh, from above. So this is considered counter shading, where you've got one color up here on the top and a lighter color down here. Um, not something that we think of a lot of shells being, uh, being some sort of visual defense, but this is an interesting case where the shell is not only that physical defense, but there's also a very real visual defense within the appearance of that shell. Another local favorite are the variable coquinas. They're those little bivalves, clam-like things that you see right at the surf where the water goes in and out. And you frequently see them in the summer. They tend to be more of a summer thing here. They'll get exposed with a wave and then you'll see them all do this where they all just kind of wiggle down right there. And these animals live in these close clusters like you see here in very shallow water where it's mostly visual predators. So things like ibis and any of the piping birds, all of those are gonna be visual predators of these animals. So when you have a ton of them all close together like this, part of that is you know safety and numbers. If there's a hundred of you, you're less likely to be the one that gets picked off. But why do we have this huge variation in color? You can see ones here that are bright orange and yellow and purple and blue and striped and plain and white and gray. So they're pretty much every color of the rainbow and all sorts of different patterns. And um, the survival theory behind this is that a predator isn't gonna be able to wipe you all out. So if you think about when you're doing a Where's Waldo, you know, or any other type of picture search type thing, um, instead of going piece by piece or person by person for a Where's Waldo and saying like, okay, this one is white and that's not Waldo. This one is purple and it's not Waldo. This one's yellow and it's not Waldo. You're gonna go through a lot faster if you just say, where's the red and white striped one? Where is it? Oh, there's red and white striped. So the idea is that when you're a predator, like an ibis, you, these different predators will train their eye to look out for one specific thing, to try and find these purples and blues, or to just find the yellows and oranges. So if you have these huge numbers and a lot of variation in the way that you appear, it's more likely that the entire population will survive. So your population might lose all the purple ones, but everybody's gonna survive. And so as a population, as a species, you have a much better chance of survival. So this one, the shell appearance is a big favorite with shellers and especially um, shell artists because of all these different colors that you can get. You can use them for all sorts of different things within shell art. Um, and then just people that are collecting, it's fun to find the variety of things. And this is one of those species that has a ton of variability in its, in its appearance. So hence variable coquina. Another one that shell appearance is really cool. This is one of, in my opinion, the most interesting um, shelled gastropods, so snails. This is the Atlantic carrier snail. This is another one of our local gastropods, but they don't live very close to shore. So they're a very uncommon find here on the beaches of Sanibel. And carrier snails are snails. They grow their own shell that coils around, but as they're growing these new additions, as they're getting bigger, they pick up things around them and glue them to that new growth. So all of these little hunks and pieces right here, they're not pieces of this snail's shell. They're other mollusk shells that they've glued to themselves. Um, in this case, this carrier shell has, carrier snail has a lot of bits and pieces of other um, broken down mollusk shells. So this may be for camouflage. There's a couple of hypotheses of why a carrier snail, 
decorates itself or carries these things. And one hypothesis is camouflage. If you live in a really rocky, rubbly area, covering yourself in a lot of rocky, rubbly stuff is gonna help you blend in. Um, so the appearance to some people isn't that stunning, um, but once you learn the biology behind it, it's really cool and really unique. Another shell appearance, um, this is a giant triton. Again, another local species that's very uncommon. And this isn't the shell per se, um, but the periostracum on the shell. So what looks like a bunch of fuzzy algae growing off of it, that's the periostracum the animal grows. So periostracum is a protective layer on the outside of shells. Um, a lot of people know the fighting, or I'm sorry, the horse conch periostracum um, that tends to flake off after the animal has died, or the ponderous arc periostracum, which is that really black fuzzy layer on top of a white shell. So with this species, the giant triton, it has these really long hair-like projections off of its periostracum. Periostracum is usually a chemical defense. You find it a little bit thicker in freshwater where the pH is lower or hydrothermal vents or some of these more extreme uh, ecosystems. These projections don't seem like they would really offer any extra chemical defense. So it's entirely possible that this is an extra part of camouflage, that it's gonna help blend in with its surroundings. Now the soft body. Some animals um, don't have a hard shell. Some mollusks don't have a hard shell and they have to defend themselves in other ways. And so one of those ways is having a body that blends in with the surrounding. So this is a ragged sea hare. This is an animal. A ragged sea hare is a type of slug, a type of sea slug. This is its little eyeball right here. This is the front of its face. These are its rhinophores. This is its body. Its foot is down here that it crawls around on. Um, so we've got a video. This is two of them crawling around in one of our previous display tanks that we had. Um, and you can see how much they look like grass and seaweed just kind of blowing in the wind. So this one, there's its eye right there. There's the front of its head. You can actually even see them breathing, opening and closing right there. Um, and same species, just some different variation, but all of these are gonna blend in with the seagrasses and the seaweeds um, that they live in out in their natural habitats. So again, this is another, um, another Sanibel species. This is one that we tend to see a lot during Ju uh, January and July in the Back Bay area, the lighthouse area. So if you're ever hoping to go see some of them, check out Lighthouse Beach in June and July and you might get lucky. Um, there's also kind of behavioral appearances. So behaviors to make yourself look different. This is the Atlantic pygmy octopus, another one of our local species. They get to be about the size of a baseball. They're not very big. Um, here it is hiding inside this cluster of oysters. Here's her eye. These are some of her suckers on her arms. Um, and this animal was actually brooding eggs. So this is an egg right here. Depending on what your screen is doing, there's the baby's eyeball right there. So there's a baby octopus inside an egg case. Um, so this animal, not only do they crawl inside an oyster cluster and change their body to look like an oyster cluster, this one is also holding an open, empty oyster shell that she then would pull over her and use like a door or a lid to that area. So behaviors to make yourself kind of disappear within your surroundings. Lettered olives, another local favorite. They've got a really pretty, shiny, interesting shaped shell, which blends in really well with the sand. Their soft body, you can see, is kind of mottled and speckled in sand colors, also really good at blending in with the sand. And then they also have this behavior of just burrowing straight down into the sand as fast as they can. Um, they'll bury themselves entirely, except for this little siphon. So that little siphon will act like a little snorkel for them while they're buried under the sand. So they spend a ton of their time just avoiding being seen. When they are out in the open, their shell and their soft body both blend in with the background. So this video is them real time. This isn't sped up or anything. That's how quickly they can bury themselves. Um, and then I have another video here. Here's one finishing up burying itself. And I'm putting some pieces of krill in the, uh, in the system. And watch how quickly this guy right here just comes up. It's already grabbing this piece of krill. So lettered olives are um, carnivores. They're opportunistic predators. They will hunt and kill or they'll eat dead stuff. 
Um, and you can see how quickly it popped out. It grabs this food. He's kind of trying to like get it in its foot. This one's still kind of burying itself. And then as soon as this one gets a good grip on it, it's gonna kind of finish popping out and then immediately head back in. So there he goes, finishes popping out only so that it can rebury themselves. So the lettered olives, and you can see that's it's made a pouch with its foot to carry that uh, krill down underneath the sand. So this is kind of a triple threat. They've got the, sh the heart, uh, actually quadruple threat. They've got a hard shell, they've got a shell appearance, they've got a soft foot appearance, and they have a behavior. And at the end there, that was one of these uh, bruised Nassau's that was coming in and photobombing on the front of the glass. So I'll watch you pop, I'll let it pop up real quick again. So you can see just how fast it is. So I've done this a couple of times with a bunch of them. And if you get a bunch of them coming up all at once, it kind of looks like a zombie movie where you didn't even know they were there. And then they just kind of come out, go after meat. So another behavioral appearance is the mimic octopus. Uh, next month, Brett Grassi is gonna be doing a really cool presentation all about cephalopods. But since cephalopods are so well known for all of their camouflage and behaviors and all this cool stuff, felt I had to at least mention one or two of them. So the mimic octopus gets its name from a behavior. It likes to mimic other animals. So here it is kind of swimming around looking maybe like a crinoid just kind of like a kind of like a sea star. They're called feather dusters, and they kind of swim around in kind of a weird, erratic, pulsing way. Uh, but they don't have a lot of um, a lot of nutritional benefit for a lot of the the bigger carnivores. Uh, this is one sitting on the bottom. You can see how it's got some nice, cool stripes. There's its head and its body and its arms. When this animal goes out swimming, it'll swim along the bottom and hold its body and arms in a way that it looks like a sole or a flounder. Sometimes it'll get up off the bottom and hold its arms in a way that look like the extremely venomous spines on a lionfish. And sometimes it'll hang down on the bottom with the rest of its body kind of buried and stick out its two striped arms, which look very similar to this extremely venomous sea snake. So some of this is its appearance with these kind of brown and white or yellow stripes. Um, being able to mimic these other animals. But then a lot of this is, are these postures, these behaviors that this specific octopus is very well known for. So some very cool behaviors that these animals do. Now I have chemical appearance. And I've got that in quotes because it's not really the chemicals that are appearing. So you're not seeing the chemicals, but you are seeing an advertisement of those chemicals. In general, if you are out in nature and you find an animal that's kind of soft and squishy and it doesn't really have any hard defenses, if it's really brightly colored, don't eat it. Uh, probably even avoid touching it. If it's able to advertise itself to possible predators, that probably means that it's going to win. Um, so nudibranchs. Nudibranchs are a group of slugs that get their name, nudie brank means naked gills, from these gills that come out the back of their body. Uh, the front here, those are rhinophores, those are for smelling. And then this is its little face, its little mouth right there. And nudibranchs eat a ton of different, uh, different things, but generally they're very specific. So it's not like us compared to us being like, oh, we're vegetarians, we only eat plants. It's more akin to somebody being like, I only eat raspberries, something extremely specific. And many of these animals will take, take on the defenses that their food already has. So nudibranchs that eat corals are able to take the stinging cells within the corals and incorporate them into their own body so that if something comes along, it, those stinging cells will sting the predator. Um, some of them are able to take on the toxins and incorporate that into their slime um, and basically just make themselves um, unpalatable. So here's a nudibranch that has um, orange or yellow, black and white stripes. That's a really common warning signal. We see that with bees, we see that with monarch butterflies, those contrasting advertisements. Um, this is a really pretty one that really shows those naked gills right there and that co the contrast between the reds and the blues and the whites. Uh, this is another type of sea slug that has a bunch of different names, blue glaucus, Atlantic glaucus, sea dragon, all sorts of different names. It's a type of slug 
and it eats man of wars. And if you've ever been in the ocean, I'm sure you've heard about man of wars or Portuguese man of wars and how potent that jellyfish's sting is. These little sea slugs eat those stinging cells. And I'm not positive on the mechanism, but they're able to eat those stinging cells without triggering them. So these are stinging cells that are pressure sensitive. When something touches them, it goes off. They're kind of spring loaded. So almost like a landmine. Um, that's why uh, even when they're dead, a jellyfish can sting you. Or even if its tentacles have been ripped off and detached from the body, those tentacles can still sting you. This animal is able to eat that, get those cells inside its body without triggering, and then keep them inside their body. Then if you come along and touch the sea slug, you'll get the same sting as if you had touched this man of war. So super, super potent sea slugs. Not only that, they're really beautiful. These color is extravagant. Um, some of that may have to do with looking like a man of war, but it may also be camouflage. These animals live way out in the open ocean where this is the color of the water. And they actually live on the surface of the water. This animal right now that we're looking at, imagine looking down at the water and this foot is right at the surface and it's hanging on the surface of the water crawling around. So it's kind of like us crawling around on the ceiling or something like that. It's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine because the sky just kind of keeps going up. Um, but yeah, they, they kind of walk around upside down on the surface of the water blending in with that bright blue water as well as looking like a Portuguese man of war and packing that same punch that a, that a uh, Portuguese man of war has. So really incredible, uh, weird, odd, odd looking, but beautiful animals. And one of my favorite things on the internet is people finding David Bowie outfits that match nudibranchs. So some of them are kind of hilarious how well they match. And this kind of begs the question of, was David Bowie some sort of venomous or toxinate, toxinate, toxic? He was able to advertise his outfits in such a way. So there's plenty more where this came from. If you are ever bored at night, just Google David Bowie nudibranch or David Bowie sea slug, and you'll find some of these awesome pictures. <laughs> So one of the last topics, this is a very common question we get, is why do they look like that? And in some cases, like some of the ones we just talked about, we have explanations for them. Sometimes the appearance to us is very striking, but that's not the benefit that the shell or the animal is getting. So one of our most common local, local examples of this is the lightning well. Very large local snail, local marine snail, and it has these stripes that kind of look like bolts of lightning. To us, that's what makes it look cool. It's big and it's got these stripes on it. For the animal, the appearance, having stripes isn't the benefit. As this animal grows, it's going to be adding a new outside edges. And each time it makes a new outside edge, that's where it makes the dark stripe. So at one point, this was the outer edge and this was the outer edge. And then it did a big growth spurt and this was the outer edge. This dark area is a lot thinner and stronger than the rest of the shell. And it takes a lot of basically energy. It's very expensive to make this. So they don't wanna spend all that energy on the entire thing. They just wanna put that energy into the very edge where it needs to be thin and sharp to pry open the bivalves that they're eating. So it's really cool, but it's just kind of a happenstance that we happen to think it looks cool. That wasn't the advantage when this animal was evolving this appearance. The appearance is just kind of a, a secondhand thing and it didn't happen to hurt the animals, so those benefits kept being passed down through generations. Another unrelated appearance is possibly carrier shells. That was one of the other ones that I showed you where it may be an appearance-related thing. They may be doing this to camouflage in with their rubbly backgrounds, but some carrier snails use really pointy things. So this carrier snail has picked up a lot of dead gastropods, looks like even a tusk shell in here, make itself really pointy. So this may be a physical defense. Again, it's very uh, costly. It's very energetically costly, very energetically expensive to make big long spines. 
So why waste your time and energy doing that when you can just pick up somebody else's hard work and glue it to you and have just as good, if not better results. So it could be a physical defense thing. The other possibility that people have thrown out as a possibility of what's happening is that this is spreading out and distributing the weight of this animal. So imagine this animal crawling around on really mucky, thick, oozy mud. If they're able to spread their weight out like wearing snowshoes, they're less likely to sink down into that muck. So it could be any of those three things. It could be none of those three things. It could be a combination of those three things. It's one of the many things that humans have yet to figure out. Another cute unrelated appearance. This is the leaf sheep sea slug. So you can see where the name leaf comes from. It looks like it's covered in a bunch of leaves. Sheep, its head looks like little sheep, it's even got little rosy cheeks. And then it's a sea slug. The appearance probably is helping it out. It looks like leaves and um, seaweed. So it probably is helping blend in with its green backgrounds. But the main purpose is actually photosynthesis. These animals will take chloroplast and put this chloroplast in parts of their body in order to do photosynthesis and get energy from that. So it's like having their own little solar farm or garden on the back of their bodies. Um, so it's primor primarily about feeding, about getting food rather than blending in with the background. Another unrelated appearance, which is on that same vein is giant clams. This is a Durasa giant clam on the left, which tends to have a lot more yellows in their mantle color. These are two Maxima giant clams, which tend to have a lot more blues in their soft body part. These are also algae growing in the body. It works a little bit different than, than those other ones that are just getting chloroplast. With these, it's actually full algaes living in these tissues. Um, the algaes are doing photosynthesis, making, you know, making food, basically giving it to the clams, and the clams are giving the algae a safe, protected place to live. So that's uh, called zooxanthellae, algaes that are living inside the tissue of an animal. So corals also have zooxanthellae. And this relationship where both things benefit, this is a symbiotic relationship called mutualism. And a lot of people, they use the term symbiotic and mutualism interchangeably, um, but there's actually different types of symbiotic relationships. Symbiotic is just two animals or plants um, having a very intimate, close relationship. So mutualism is the one that most people know of. It's mutually beneficial. Both things are getting a positive result. Parasitism is another very common symbiotic relationship that most people know the principle of. One thing benefits and one thing is harmed. Um, and then the third symbiotic relationship that a lot of people have never heard of, but is super, super common, is called commensalism. That's where one thing benefits and the other thing is just neutral. So it's not being hurt. It's not benefiting. It's just kind of there along for the ride. Um, so anyways, in this case, this is mutualism, mutually beneficial. Now we have a lot of things that we just don't know why they look like that. And we don't even have a good guess for why they look like that. Our local horse conch, our biggest local gastropod, second largest shell gastropod in the world is bright orange. Its body looks like salmon. So this is a very large predator. Once they get a about 12 inches or so, which they can get to 24 inches, they don't really have any other predators. Even a nurse shark is gonna struggle to be able to get that in its mouth and crush it. So if you're a big apex predator, you don't need to warn anybody. So why are you bright orange? They're not living in an ecosystem that's bright orange. So why are you bright orange? Um, these are edible, people eat them. They're not poisonous. So you're not warning about anything. And making this type of bright color, we assume must be expensive. It must be um, metabolically expensive. They're not just getting this color from something they eat. So even with flamingos, it's not just as simple as getting the color from the krill they eat, um, but it's, it's still not even that relationship where the pigment's kind of already being available to it. So this is something that we have no clue why something would be this bright orange. And maybe it, maybe there is a reason, Maybe there isn't, maybe there was just a, an orange mutation and those animals didn't die out and it somehow ended up becoming um, a, a dominant allele or something. So a lot of this stuff, we just don't know. 
another local one, the yellow prickly cockle. You can see it's got a bunch of yellow to it and it's got prickles on it and it's a cockle. So yellow prickly cockle. There's also the Florida prickly cockle that is about the same size, same shape, same habitat, but doesn't have yellow to it. And it's doing just fine without the yellow. So what's the benefit of having the yellow? Um, is it something where this color has a different flexibility or different sturdiness where it's not necessarily the appearance, it's the, um, the physical properties? We don't really know. Um, some species with this yellow, they harbor bacteria that use sulfurs in their, uh, in their biochemical processes. And then those sulfurs basically end up getting into the shell. Some will sequester wastes inside their shell as it grows. So this one, there are some guesses of why certain things have yellow, uh, but on this one, we really don't know. No reason that we can think of why it really yellow would be beneficial. The giant triton. I already talked to you about the giant triton's periostracum with that big fuzz. This is the bottom of it. This is the foot. And in real life, it's even more of a neon green. It's like neon green, psychedelic, polka dotted, psychedelic looking leopard's, leopard spots. What is the benefit of this? If this periostracum is about hiding and is about camouflage, then why is it advertising the rest of this? Um, it has a nice hard shell, so it doesn't really need to blend in. Is this really blending in with something? Um, again, one that we just have, we have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea what's going on with these. And if you've ever watched any of my other presentations, you know that that's kind of a big theme that I like to, that I like to end on, is there's just so much we don't know. For as much that we do know, and as many cool things as we observe and we, you know, are interested in, there's just well above and beyond those things, things that we don't know and we haven't yet explored yet. So hopefully that gets you excited for some of the things left to come this summer, um, where hopefully people will explain more of the things we do know. Thank you, Becca. You're welcome. And thank you. Thank you for uh, linking uh, mollusks and David Bowie. <laughs> I've had David Bowie stuck in my head since since we did the practice yesterday. Yeah, yeah. The, the chat room lit up when uh, the, the, the connection. Um, so, folks, if you have questions, please um, please hit the chat button there on the bottom and type them in. There are a couple here from Helen, and let's see. The first is, are there still mollusks yet to be discovered and named? If so, what areas are being explored? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, things are, unfortunately, a lot of them are going extinct before we can even name them. Um, a big area anywhere, doesn't matter what group you're looking at, is deep sea stuff. There's kind of this number that's thrown out that every time a submersible goes down into the deep water, that 12 new species are discovered. Even in our collection up here, our research collection, we have things that are unnamed. We know it's a new species. We know nobody has named it yet. If you look on our shell guide on online, we have things that will say a genus, like we're the genus, genus Homo, and then SP. It means we know it belongs to this genus. We have no clue what species it is. And either we don't know because it's, um, we can't really identify it very well. Maybe it's a broken specimen, but a lot of them are just like, we know it needs to be named yet. So deep sea is a big place for looking at stuff and really small stuff, looking inside soils, looking inside um, sediments, going through you know, samples of sand. So the really little stuff is a lot of where we still have yet to discover. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Jane. Are these presentations saved so that they can be viewed later? I'm thinking grandkids. Uh, Jane, yes, absolutely. They're, they're, all of our online lectures are recorded and made available through the museum's website. Uh, it, sometimes it takes a few days for us to, to get them up there, but if you go to our website, you'll be able to find them there. Um, let's see, another question from Helen. Are rising ocean temperatures due to climate change affecting the number and colors of mollusks hmm. and which oceans are most affected? Yeah. Definitely the numbers. I don't know about the colors. Um, I would think over long term, as we start losing coral reefs, as their as their habitats change, I would think that different colors would be selected for. 
but that would be thousands, that wouldn't be something we'd see in our lifetime. That'd be, you know, thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and then how is it affecting, was it numbers was the other part of it? Yep. And where? Um, and, and yeah, and if there are some oceans where the, where the yeah. problem is worse than others. So, yeah, so there's kind of different parts of global, of climate change that affect different things. So warming is a really big problem for particularly coral reefs. So with that habitat death, you lose everything that lives on coral reefs, which is thousands of species of fish and mollusks. Um, in some areas where maybe it's not a coral reef, but we're seeing things getting warmer further north, we're seeing changes in ranges. We're not necessarily seeing we're just completely a collapse. We're seeing things going further north than they used to. And then over time, that can push out the stuff that used to be in those northern areas. The really big issue with ocean mollusks is ocean acidification, which isn't in itself a climate change, but it comes from the same reason. As we burn fossil fuels and all this CO2 goes up into the atmosphere, about 25% of that is absorbed in, into the oceans. And when that absorption happens, there's a complicated chemical process that happens, then the pH of the water goes down. It becomes more acidic. And the same things happen that you would think of as putting something in acid, hard things dissolve. So if you put in a huge fully grown horse conch, you're probably not gonna see a difference. But for those larvae that are maybe only a few millimeters thick, it definitely is having observable effects on the reproduction. Some of the big areas tend to actually right now be cold areas. Um, on the Pacific Northwest, kind of the Seattle area, there are scallop fisheries that have seen a drop by about a third in 10 years maybe, mm -hmm. um, specifically because of ocean acidification. And they're seeing that same problem in the Gulf of Maine with just this extreme acidification that is just destroying these populations in just a couple of years. Okay, um, a question from Gail. Is the crab that lives in the parchment tube worm, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Coman salicyan? Uh, Did you see that? I'm looking, yeah, looking for it. <laughs> oh, commensalism. All right, thanks. Um, is the crab that lives in the parchment tube worm commensalism? I don't know because I didn't know there was a crab that lived in the, <laughs> in the tube worm. Um, if it's there afterwards, if it's once the tube worm has died, and it's just the tube, then those aren't considered a uh, symbiotic because it's afterwards, the two animals aren't together. Um, if they're living there together and that's a common thing, I would think it's commensalism. Otherwise you probably would have known it as a parasite. You, you know, when things are a parasite, it's usually pretty obviously labeled that way in the readings. So I would hazard to guess commensalism, but that is also not knowing at all what the crab that, that you're talking about is. Okay, another question here. How, whoa, where'd it go? Uh, how are artificial reefs impacting marine life? Sunken ships, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, um, different ways in different places. Um, a lot of those, they're so small that they, they're not having huge impacts. One of the things that is kind of a, a more magnified impact than just having one thing is being able to create these kind of hopscotch areas. So if this reef here and this reef here have lost that center reef, and now the animals here and here don't have any way to interact and mix, uh, you know, mix genetic material and that type of thing, creating an artificial reef here as kind of a bridge between the two, that can have a huge impact, a beneficial impact on, um, on the populations of those other two not related. That's where artificial reefs can really, really do well. Um, there's also some artificial reefs happening further inland um, that help really with water quality, things where you're trying to help build oyster beds. Those are also really, really beneficial to the entire local habitat. I had a question actually about carrier snails, which, yeah. which came up twice in your talk, which are, Amazing, and there's a there's there's an incredible exhibit of cario shells in in the Great Hall of Shells at the museum, but you know often you know see those and and it's it's hard to believe that you know they there it, it occurs in nature. It's almost like you yeah. know somebody has very carefully you know taken yeah. these beautiful shells and sort of attached it, 
and you mentioned a couple times they 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 you know they they glue them you know they sort of pick one from glue so how does that happen like what what, what is <laughs> what is this what is this yeah. what is this glue i mean do we know or is this and, and do we you know as we know anything about I mean, they seem to have yeah. an artistic sense too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so as far as the mechanics of it or the chemistry of it, from my understanding, it's not a separate material. It's like setting something in concrete. So as they're building the shell, they just kind of oh. hold it there and build the shell yeah. around it. That's idea. my understanding, but that could be incorrect. Yeah. Um, and the other part of it too, you know, they were talking about having an artistic sense to it. Yeah, there's a lot of them that look like there's some sort of problem solving or decision-making going on that it can't see, it's just doing this by feel. Um, that again, when yeah, when I look at them, my thought is there's a lot more going on with this animal than we ever give it credit for. Um, beyond that, I don't know what it is. I haven't studied those animals at all. But yeah, it's one of those ones that you look at and you're just like, that doesn't seem like a snail could do that. That seems <laughs> fake. <laughs> okay, well, we're out of questions. Great talk. I think it's Thank further you. evidence, Becca, by you've got uh, um, you know folks uh, trying to book you for 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 other talks right here in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you everybody for for your great questions and for joining us uh, this evening today. And um, and please join us for future programs this summer and fall. And and check out showmuseum.org for more information on those. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.